Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Martin Ivey from K3 CISPRO. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, as we've just been asked, and I've been asked to point out, it is being recorded. Uh, and um, so if you'd like a copy of it to share with any of your colleagues, um, then please do email Kelly at the end and she can uh, point you in the direction of the link for it. Um, so we're going to be joined by Sean in a little while, uh, but before we introduce Sean, just wanted to just thank you for your time this morning um, and um, just to uh, do the introductions. Um, so I'm Martin from K3 CISPRO and I look after new business um, with the group, with specifically with the CISPRO side of the business. Um, being joined by Sean, and I'm sure Sean will introduce himself in more detail when he gets started, but Sean's been uh, involved in supply chain and um, disruptive transformation for quite a long time. You know, his background was over 25 years, including 10 years with SAP and some leading players in industry, people like BAE Systems and Cadbury Schweppes, United Nations, people like that. And as I say, Sean will give you more information when he, when he gets started. Um, we're running to about uh, 11.30 this morning in total. So there'll be time at the end, last 15, 20 minutes will be for questions. A question and answer session so uh, but obviously as we're going through if you've got anything please uh, go into the chat or raise your hand um just tell you a little bit more about k3 for those that haven't met us before um i know that we've got a couple of our existing customers on the call this morning so welcome to you guys um k3 deliver erp solutions uh, into industry so we have a couple of platforms that we sell. We have a, a Sage platform, we have a Microsoft platform, and we have the CISPRO platform. A whole range of uh, of customers that we deal with, so quite a plethora of different sort of operations. IMO, uh, I make electronic components, which are sourced in India and Europe, and then distribute specifically for the sort of water industry. So they've been very, very, very busy. Water and waste industry, they've been very, very busy through the, the pandemic. People like SIC who make wiring harnesses for, for automotive. Um, you know, and and other applications as well. Uh, Adient to our an aerospace business. So again, although you might think that aerospace is, is is down the tubes a little bit, it's actually quite buoyant at the moment. Adient um, are involved in aircraft interiors, and that's a big sort of like um, uh, growing market at the moment. As people, uh, you know, are, we're looking for more exuberant offers for their first class customers to tempt people back on board. Um, we've got people like Boss Designs who are. Um, those of you who don't know, they're, they're involved in seating manufacturer for offices and commercial applications um, and even diverse businesses like Peregrine Live Foods who are actually very, very busy again in the lockdown because as you'll have probably seen, a lot of people have decided to invest in having pets and exotic animals to keep during the lockdown and they supply actually live food that you might need to feed your snakes and spiders and things like that and they've been really, really busy. So our background is, you know, very, very diverse. It's manufacturing, it's distribution, uh, wholesaling, et cetera. Um, so, you know, and, and, and hence why we get involved in these presentations, because obviously we, we feel well aligned, um, you know, with people like Sean. So um, after the event, if there's any questions you have, or if you'd like to see the videos of the recordings, then please do um, get in touch with Kelly. Her details uh, are on the screen there. Um, and obviously you've got the meeting, the invites from her as well, so you'll have her details on there. And I will hand over to Sean. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, let me just go into my session. OK, now I was going to get quick introductions to who I am. I think, Martin, you've covered that and you can press pause on the video afterwards if you want to read all of that materials. Um, there's three parts to this mini masterclass, and I apologise, I've probably got far more material than I have time, so I'm going to go through this at a fair clip. Um, but I want to start off by talking about why why we're going through such a big disruptive period right now, um, what challenges this is creating for businesses, and how do you change business mindsets and your models so that you can not just survive through this period, but actually thrive. Um, during the presentation, I'm going to use a few videos, give a few examples. At the start, I'm going to use a couple of videos to show some of the sort of new types of technologies that are emerging and how that's enabling people to rethink you know, so their supply chain network or rethink the way they deliver products or the, rethink their supply, um, supplier base, those sorts of things. And then in the latter part, I'm going to use a couple of examples of how organizations um, think differently. The ones that are successful in this 
wave of change how, how they think about their business and how they think about their customers and how they um, have a different mindset to the traditional business and I'm going to use a few examples through that it, it's very very rich material this um, I'm going to use a lot of case studies I'm going to use a lot of personal experience and stuff so I think it's going to be a case of sort of hold on to your desks and let's go through it okay um, very quickly what, what fascinates me um, personally is um, you know really trying to understand how a lot of this sort of material connects. I'm, you know, throughout my career, um, I've, I've been, you know, I spent far too much time reading stuff like this and not enough time reading autobiographies and works of fiction, to be fair. But e each one of these books, each one of these different pieces of information that you read, you know, has something of interest, but it's it's incomplete. It, it's one particular element, be that innovation or execution or supply chain or leadership or mindset or those sorts of things. And really, where I've been focused throughout my career is, is sort of connecting them together. How do these how do they connect so that you can have an organization wide transformation rather than just a, a an improvement in one little area? And I think you'll get a get a taste of that as we go through. Right. Can can someone's on um, speaking on mute? Can I get people on mute just unless they want to speak, please? Would that be okay? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Right then, let's um Let's talk about what's going on right now. So this is a this is a military term that's been co-opted by most of the major consultancies, um, and the term's called VUCA. And it says, right now we're going through a VUCA period. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex and ambiguous. And I'm sure you've all heard that um, been mentioned in the past. One thing that I found really interesting when um, I first started to hear this term being used back in 2011, 2012, was everyone said and agreed that it is VUCA right now, and it's very complex and everything's really changeable but no one explained why and and that really fascinated me because uh, you know i started working in the 1980s and and then you know went through the 90s and, and it it didn't feel like this it didn't feel like the change was as disruptive or as immediate as it is right now it felt like you know you had a good idea what next year was going to be like because you could basically look at last year and add a couple of percentage points on it or, or take a couple off based on what you felt was going to happen in your particular industry now, I spent a lot of time researching this, six years of my life and most of my pension and life savings, um, coming up with a book called Transition Point. And what, one of the major things that's actually driving these um, periods of change is something called waves of creative destruction. Um, I do whole presentations on this, so I'm going to keep it really short. But basically, the upswing is, is a time of experimentation and entrepreneurship, and that's where we're in right now. And the downswing is much more about efficiencies and exploitations. Now, these waves are about 40 to 50 years long, um, and 60% of the cycle is in the upswing period. So we're going through this time of experimentation and entrepreneurship, whereas from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, we were going through this more efficiencies and exploitation period, where, which is why companies were focusing on lean, why companies were focusing on offshoring, why they were you know, trying to, you know, delight shareholders by removing as much cost from the, their operation. Whereas now, the way to delight shareholders is much more about innovation and disruption and, and organisations that just look at cost savings are potentially ones that could be in, in some trouble. So we're right in this most disruptive period, the, the six waves upswing. It's, it's, it's the most disruptive time. It's also the most dangerous time um, because it's when you've got power struggles between the old ways of doing things and the new ways. And the people whose livelihoods are attached to the old ways of doing things are generally um, you know, feeling quite nervous right now because their industry has been disrupted by, by obviously these new disruptions, these new innovations and these new industries. Interestingly, with this wave, we're in the, what we call the sixth wave right now. Um, this is very unique in so much as there are a whole host of different forces that are working on every industry all at the same time. And this has been particularly unique. Previously, disruption has been limited to a certain degree to certain industries, such as the automotive industry, for example, in, in the sort of fourth wave. The computer industry in the fifth wave you know there's been a number of different shifts that have been very industry specific but right now it's completely global um completely sort of industry agnostic really affecting everyone there, you know there isn't an, an organization in the world or a place in the world where they're not feeling the impacts of the six wave sort of digital revolution and it's causing a whole host of sort of power battles and paradigm shifts. So some of the paradigm shifts are including we've moved very much from sort of the company being in control to actually now the consumers much more in control. We've gone from a sort of single channel um, distribution network to omni channels. We've gone from physical shopping to online shopping, very much so since you know COVID. 
We've gone from the consumer traveling the retailer to the retailer delivering to the consumer. Again, something that's massively exploded due to you know, everyone being housebound during the COVID period, which means we've gone from linear push supply chains to cyclical pull value chains, from pod products to services and experiences, from ownership to access, and obviously from man or women to machine. And it's that last bit I'm going to focus on now particularly. Because um, so what has happened really is we've moved from sort of very much a supply push sort of product based chain to a much more customer centric sort of value network. And I particularly like, you know, Mark Engels, who's the chief supply chain officer of Unilever's quote on this, which says supply chain is no longer a chain. It's now a circle with the customer, in fact, the consumer at its heart. And I think that's absolutely true. But the challenge for most organizations means that actually this whole new supply chain model is you know, exponentially more complex. So we've moved from product life cycles that were long to ones that were short. We've moved from levels of product complexity that was low to high, product variety that was low to high. Number of long lead time parts have gone from few to many. The level of forecast accuracy has gone from relatively high, as much as it could be, to actually terribly low right now. Customer expectations have gone from pretty generic to very, very high. Levels of product customization has gone from low to high. And quite interestingly, specifically around e-commerce, the number of customer returns has gone from something that's you know, a very small part of the business kind of after four, usually a little corner of the warehouse, to actually in most you know, e-commerce based retailers, it's the single biggest source of inventory into their warehouse is customer returns. And in fact, in things like you know, apparel, specifically female apparel, where between sort of 56 and 60% of everything that's been acquired online gets sent back. Now, to handle all of this complexity, you know, the, we're now starting to talk about different strategic directives. So in the downswing, it was very much about lean. It was very much about cross control. And actually, most organizations saw their supply chains, very foolishly saw their supply chains as just one single entity and focus very much on one single variable within that entity, most of it being things like, you know, the, where the biggest costs were, for example, labor. But resilience is actually all about, you know, the ability to withstand the unknown. That's the ability to sense and respond and adapt without falling into chaos. So in the downswing, actually, you know, disruptions were relatively unlikely and specifically when your organization was relatively local. But now, of course, disruptions are more likely to be a certainty. And we're seeing things like COVID, Brexit, US trade wars, et cetera, where organizations are having to become completely comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know, because these shocks are becoming the norm. And what a lot of organizations have found is that, they, you know, their previous focus on leaning their supply chain has left them perilously exposed in this new disruptive upswing specifically offshoring, which is even though it brought labor costs down, it has exposed them to much more you know, risks and longer lead times. So what we're seeing is that supply chains are lacking global resilience and they're breaking down in the face of multicultural disruptions. Supply chain operations are becoming more costly, often representing companies' highest costs. And most of this cost control was completely downswing behavior. But as I said, now we're going to be in the upswing for at least the next decade. So we really need to move away from thinking like that. Because cost control requires a you know, high degree of predictability, and we just don't have that high degree of predictability right now. But help is at hand. So because we're right at the start of this, there's a whole host of new innovations that are coming about. So there's a whole load of really disruptive technologies that have been sort of deceptively built behind the scenes, but they're all about to break cover. Um, this is from 2018, but it's a good example because I think um, some of the later ones have focused on some very weird technologies. But this was a good example of some that's starting to hit right now because they've moved down into the trough of disillusionment and up to the slope of enlightenment for things like autonomous driving, blockchain, digital twins, smart work paces, all these sorts of things is all about to hit you know, industry. And it's causing what I call the creative destruction triple whammy. Now, whammy number one is the, you know, the automation of physical tasks for all the things we used to do with the things on the end of our wrists being automated by machines. Whammy number two is our mind to machine. So it's the automation of knowledge based tasks. And this is the one that has a lot of people spooked because we haven't seen this before. And then whammy number three is uh, the convergence of these technologies. So it's the automation of the end to end supply chain. So it's a machine to machine you know, um, end automation of the whole end-to-end -end process. 
So let's look at this here. So in whammy number one, to go, I go across the different areas in the process, you can see there's a whole raft of new technologies that are about to hit from everything in source, where we've got agrotech with robots that can pick very fragile fruits, such as strawberries from the ground, all the things we used to think only human nimble fingers can do, to counting the fruit on trees, to trucks that drive themselves in iron ore and coal mines, to autonomous ships that I think companies like Rolls-Royce are working on, to autonomous planes that companies like Airbus are working on, to fully autonomous ports, where Rotterdam was the first fully autonomous port, and now every major port in the world has got an automation program where it's pretty much driving out most of the human labor and replacing it with autonomous carts, autonomous shipping container moving devices, autonomous cranes, those sorts of things. Let's go to make. Make has always been an area of, for the last wave, certainly where we've seen robotics, but they're generally been big, single purpose, expensive things. Um, if you wanted the robot to do a different thing, you needed a different robot and therefore it only really was applicable to industries that had high volume, high value items like cars, for example. But now we've got things like Baxter and Sawyer, the second image down, which are collaborative robots, which means they're cheap, they're you know very affordable, they can do different things. The software enables them to do different things from packing to line unloading to you know machine tendering, all these different things. You can change the end of arm toolings. So they're collaborative, these collaborative robots or cobots as they're called, are very adaptable and very affordable. We've got 3D printing that can now print very complex things such as jet engines, as you see there, and things like titanium. We've got other things underneath that called, uh, which are it's called carbon liquid printing. I'll show you a video on that in a moment. We can even 3D print things like houses. Let's move over to deliver. Now, deliver is an area that actually has got a wave of automation up until this wave. It's always needed human hands to pick, pack, load, and deliver, drive. All of these things require the human to do it. But you know, ever since sort of Kiva Robotics changed the paradigm from the, the picker having to go to the inventory to the inventory coming to the picker. And then Amazon, of course, saw that and acquired the entire company for $775 million in cash back in 2012. You know, we've seen a massive wave of automation in logistics. And then we've got other things coming like, you know, autonomous trucks, drones, road robots that you can see across you know, many cities now in the UK and the US, and even things at the bottom there like motherships where Daimler's working with Starship Robotics to put, you basically create a suburban mobile warehouse, which, uh, you know, an autonomous truck that's filled with robots that can scatter to, you know, suburban areas and deliver to suburban areas. In cell, we've got things like um, 2D barcodes that allow you to buy things from mobile phones. That chap at the top there is in South Korea. Um, it looks like he's picked the bottle up. He hasn't, he's using his phone to scan a car barcode. Those products don't actually exist. It's just a screen. The people behind them are actually boarding a train. So that means we are now able to turn a bus stop or a pillar or a wall into a retail store. Um, beneath that, you've got things like Amazon Go, this just, just walk out technology, um, where we actually, it, Amazon have looked at removing the inconvenience to the shopper by basically taking away the queue and the till. We've got robots like Pepper that can do retail assistant work. We've got FBI listening devices in our houses now, like the Amazon Echo, which allows us to order things by voice. And Amazon have even got things like the dash replenishment system where your printer or your water filter will simply reorder replacement parts for itself. And of course, it orders it from Amazon. Let's have a quick look at one of those. Um, let's look at clip printing, because I think it might be interesting when I saw the names of some of the companies on here, but let's have a quick look at what they're doing. Design, deliver. With Carbon, you can design, engineer, make and deliver end use parts all in one system of connected products. We call it the speed cell. With it, we're redefining how products are made, transforming impossible concepts and designs directly into end use parts at any scale. Make the impossible. Carbon allows designers and engineers to create freely, simplify complex assemblies, produce unmoldable lattices with the widest range of mechanical properties found in additive manufacturing. Anything is possible. Design it, engineer it, make one, make a million. With Carbon, make any number of end use parts economically equal. A factory for each part, every person at any scale. Innovate the speed of thought by designing the means of production. Dramatically compress product development time and greatly reduce expense over a product's life cycle. Carbon is making the impossible at scale. Unprecedented flexibility, iterative speed. 
Speed Cell and Carbon's next generation additive manufacturing tech will redefine your business. Stop prototyping. Start producing. So that's that's you know the sort of technology that's enabling companies, especially OEMs, to look at their entire supply chain and go, do you know what? We can probably now start to make things that we previously couldn't make, but we can also make them on demand. So why do we need such a long and extended supply chain as we've got right now? And what it's causing is a, a quite interesting wave is, is that it's moving businesses back to where the consumers are. Um, the downside of offshoring, of course, was that you had to buy in big volume, they had very long lead times, but also actually in this sort of pursuit of low labor costs, a lot of companies got burnt by you know, some extremely bad headlines around working conditions. So if you remember things like the Rana Plaza disaster, for example, back in 2013, where you know a lot of consumers suddenly realized that the, the cost of disposable fashion was disposable lives. But now we've got things like the Sobot robot, for example, that can make as many um, pieces of apparel t-shirts as 17 factory workers, which means it completely changed the economies of scale and means that companies can start to reposition manufacturing actually where the consumers are rather than where cheap labor is. And we're seeing this sort of disruptive on-demand manufacturing model sort of really emerge now. Amazon, for example, has had a patent for an on-demand clothing manufacturing warehouse for about eight years now, I think, since they actually filed it. So they'll be working on that behind the scene. And it, it's causing a huge amount of global disruption. Amazon, for example, most people just still think Amazon's a bookseller, you know, unbelievably enough. Um, Amazon is the second biggest manufacturer of clothes in the United States, and most people don't know it makes clothes. And we're about to see a, le a logistics revolution about to occur. All of these sort of disruptive technologies that we've been talking about now for about the last five to eight years are really going to start to break cover this year and the next year. Everything from drones to road robots to autonomous trucks to um, ASRS systems at the bottom there, automated storage and retrieval systems and the mothership concepts that I talked about earlier. All of these are really reaching maturity where they're about to sort of cross the chasm into the mainstream. Now, obviously, we're in a war. We're in a we're in a war against each company, and we're also in a war against different countries. And China, you know, where most of the work was offshore, they've already said very clearly that you know low cost labor is not the future for us. In fact, their labor isn't the lowest cost, and it hasn't been for a while now because their middle class is growing. So the Chinese government now heavily incentivizes companies to automate. The more you automate, the bigger your tax breaks, because they want to push something called the Made in China 2025 initiative, where they become the world's leading manufacturer um, by the middle of this decade, but by focusing not on people, but on automation. And these are the sorts of automation that we're talking about here. So these sort of um, new platform based robotics like Pepper, like Sawyer and Baxter in the middle, or like the ABMB cobot over there, you know, they're able to do many different things based on the software they can do. So they're really hardware platforms that are completely adaptable. And the thing that's different in this wave to previous waves is that actually they're not just replacing human jobs as machines did before, they're actually replacing human capabilities. And they're doing it for an increasingly smaller price point, and also they're getting smarter all the time. Now, as I mentioned earlier, COVID has provided a rocket fuel for this automation revolution, which means that the reality of this current wave is that we are finding out very quickly that humans are too slow, our forecasting is too inaccurate, our planning cycles are too infrequent. These things we used to call black swans are now incredibly common and, and not so rare anymore. Human behavior biases, these sorts of things is just too irrational and consumer expectations are getting too demanding. And we need now sort of supply chains to adapt in real time. And we're finding that really difficult to handle, which is why whammy number two is becoming particularly attractive to a number of organizations, specifically machine learning. This is the ability for machines to figure out how to complete tasks without having to have you know, a human code it. Because you know, the real issue here is sort of dealing with the uncertainties. And I particularly like this quote from Alex Harvey, who's the head of robotics and autonomous systems at Ocado, and I heard him speak probably about four years ago, and he said, the challenge is you know, dealing with the uncertainties. We simply can't write enough if-then-else statements to cover all possible situations. We need machines to figure them out for themselves. And that is exactly what's happening. So machine learning has got some, gone from sort of supervised learning, where we teach it the rules and we, we explain how to do things, right up to sort of un, supervised learning where we're saying here's a mass of unstructured data that we don't understand try and make sense of it and understand the trends and, and it's able to do that and able to learn from its own experiences 
So companies like Amazon, Merck, J and J, Unilever, these sorts of organisations are all turning to sort of more artificial intelligence based planning systems. Now, there's four different levels. Um, for level one is sort of descriptive, which is a bit like my example there is a bit like, you know, telling your supply chain is in, in a traffic jam. Great, that's very nice for you to tell me, but I kind of already knew. Level two is more predictive. It's telling you what's going on, but it's not this, uh, they're giving you any options. That requires level three, prescriptive proposals, where this is where we would get starting to add real value because it's not just saying you've got an issue in your supply chain or in your business, but it's actually giving you options. And level four is where the supply chain just figures it out for itself. It's completely fully autonomous. So level one and level two are really humans making decisions using data from machines. Level three is humans making decisions using recommendations from machines. And level four is machines making the decisions and then reporting back to the humans afterwards. And the interesting thing is we are already at level four. So systems like ERA, for example, you know, complete cognitive operating systems that companies like J&J &J and Unilever and Merck are using to automate up to sort of 60% of their supply chains. Anything that's got a sort of, a, a relatively baseline level of forecast in, integrity and, and it isn't sort of massively volatile, you know, they're being able to completely automate that. And the interesting thing is they communicate with that system by voice. They just ask it questions. The problem we're finding is that the amount of data inputs we're getting across the world is increasing exponentially. The, you know, the amount of machine brain power is also improving exponentially, but you know, our, our you know, relatively human cognitive capability is remaining static. So interestingly, systems like ERA, for example, track whether or not the recommendations that they gave the humans were followed and whether or not the, inter the human intervention improved or worsened the outcome. And what they're finding, you know, and the results of this, and I was, I was talking to ERA very recently, as they're saying, nearly in every instance when a human actually intervened, it made things worse. So we're finding out that human biases or limited cognitive power or attachments to past knowledge are bottlenecks. So we're moving very quickly from a world where we're saying, look, we, we need the machines to be glass boxes. We need to understand exactly how you came to that decision. You know, and we prefer that over these black boxes situations. But, you know, as we're starting to trust the algorithms and actually the amount of data and the calculations becoming so complicated, we're just beginning to let the machines do their job and just get out of the way. Now, interestingly, we haven't seen anything yet. As I said, we're right at this upswing. So things like AI, robotics, autonomous vehicles, they're all on a massive upswing and they're all going to cross the chasm pretty soon. And with that leads me very nicely into the whammy number three, which is the convergence, which means we're bringing all of these technologies together. So we're having sort of centralized planning and control system, automated planning control systems that are able to get data from everything from project digitization, visualization and design, goods transportation, manufacturing, transactional process, and all of this data has been captured, collated, turned into something that resembles, you know, sense sent back to the humans or actually just used to make on the demand adjustments to the system sense and respond capabilities. Now, 5G is going to be very important to us because actually 5G is a technology that's really required to sort of bring together two Internet of Things, the industrial Internet of Things and the consumer's Internet of Things, where they put devices and everything from wind turbines to trucks to 3D printers to robots and connect it together to the devices that are in our, you know, our household compliances, our watches, our clothing, our thermostats, collecting all of that data being able to you know, connect it, make sense of it, and use it to create a sort of sense and response supply chain. Now, this is allowing companies to really rethink how they do things. So things like um, modular manufacturing or what they call the factory in the box concept has come up. This is particularly interesting. So it's a bringing together of all of these technologies and the companies actually using them to say, maybe we can use these technologies in order to completely change the nature of our supply chain network and put manufacturing in places where it didn't make economic sense before or use it to put very sort of mobile factories whilst we test out a market so i'm going to show you a quick video that explains that the requirements of the future um, are changing big times um, we have more and more the need of local manufacturing in specific countries. We have a need to be very flexible and agile in, for example, prototype factories. We have uh, increasing logistics costs throughout the world and therefore the concept of a distributed factory, a distributed factory network is just there. <laughs> In future, we are going to see new requirements to factory layouts, which go away from mass production and large-scale factories 
to small production facilities which work sustainable and hit the needs of the customer. And therefore, we are looking for a modular approach to bring containers to the customer and produce on demand there. We have already concrete use cases, new product introduction. So we want to offer factory on demand or factory as a service for startups so that they can rent factories for two months in order to produce their prototypes of their products. In the factory in a box concept is helping to fulfill that requirements in a very modular way um, where not too much manufacturing know-how is needed in the different countries and where you can flexibly ship a factory where needed and then if the demand is disappearing you can ship it somewhere else. That we are going to bring production technology, IT and communications technology together in an integrated blueprint. So that we are going to be able to make our containers smart, conscious, intelligent and this is requiring a total new way of approaching the design of the factories of the future. I think that last point is really important because it it requires new thinking, you know, new ways of thinking about your organisation, and I'm going to that's where I'm going to focus when we move into that section. So what we're seeing come together is this sort of physical and digital worlds, this sort of overlaying of a digital world on top of the physical world, and things like artificial reality and and virtual reality becoming, you know, really big opportunities for a lot of businesses to. You know, for example, you know, design and lay out a factory before you break ground on it. So you, you can even train people on how to operate a factory before it's actually been built, those sorts of things. Um, and it, it's been driven by something called the digital twins. Um, so we're able to cap put sensors in buildings that enable us to create complete digital replicas of everything from, from buildings to pipelines to engines to entire vehicles and see how they're operating. So the supply chain is becoming much more, you know, self-aware, much more predictive, and that's very important for things like, you know, the spare parts industry and predictive maintenance industries, where, you know, rather rather than doing sort of just scheduled maintenance, you can actually be much more specific and, you know, really identify where you've got, you know, machines that are running hot, for example, or bottlenecks in your flows or leaks in your pipes, those sorts of things, before they become an issue. It's creating an entire paradigm shift in the supply chain. So. The, the fifth wave supply chain was the invisible supply chain, as I call it. So effectively, the supply chain never really got much attention at board level unless something went wrong and then it got all the attention. So it really only got a lot of attention for, you know, when, when things were an issue and most of the other times it was just, can you cheapen things? But now we're talking about supply chain being very visible and very transparent. And when I mean visible, I mean visibility of not just of the flow of product, but also the flow of information and also the flow of money. Now, given us that sort of visibility enables us to have insight into, you know, the things like energy consumption, water consumption. It allows us to have visibility of the waste across the end to end supply chain, which enables us to identify where our weak spots and our constraints and our risks are. And that also enables me, and this is becoming increasingly important because it's becoming more important for the consumer, is it enables us to understand what our supply chain impact what the ethical impact of the supply chain, where things are being sourced, what the ecological impact, what we're doing with our byproducts and our waste, and also, of course, what the economic impact is and, you know, specifically um, whether or not we're exposing ourselves to a risk further down the line. But one of the important things is that it's creating visibility around completely new business opportunities. And this is where the mindset bit comes in. So, for example, the placing of sensors and things in cars is enabling people to understand, specifically insurance companies, to understand you know, how the car is being driven so they can start to offer much more personalized rather than generalized insurance premiums. So rather than sort of an insurance premium that just looks at your your, your age and your sex, this says, right, you're, you're a young man between the ages of 18 and 21, therefore your insurance premium is going to be very high. Now they're saying, well, it actually it depends on how you drive. You might be a very stable and safe driver and we'll base the insurance premium around your personal behavior. Another example is healthcare. So we're now using sensors and devices just to completely rethink not only personal life insurance, because again, at the moment it's very generic. How old are you? Do you smoke? Those sorts of things, but actually really start to understand what's going on at a sort of a biological level. So we're getting these sort of biochemistry digital twins. So a lot of, it's not just about efficiency, it's about the visibility of completely new business opportunities. 
So we're moving from where data was always very lag. It was sort of looking for the rear view mirror where, you know, it was all about selling products and then making money. And then we'd record what we did afterwards to a whole new model where it's much more about, you know, using data to define what products we should create and then making money at the back of it. So being driven by insights. So the future supply chain is one that I call the power supply chain. It's incredibly personalized, personalized products, personalized services, personalized experiences, very automated across the end supply chain and also local, local production, local logistics and retail. And the advantages of the business world is that the shorter the supply chain, the stronger the supply chain, the more sustainable it is and the more agile it is. Right. So that's what's going on. Now, the problem is whilst that technology is becoming very disruptive, not every company is going to be able to take advantage of it. And one thing is most companies are you know, beginning to realize is that the future looks nothing like the past. So the things might look like plain sailing and relatively stable roads in the past, but the future is looking pretty windy and pretty rocky. And one of the biggest challenges in most organizations is the cultural lag. So whilst technology changes at an exponential rate, what we see is that people in organizations don't. They change at a very linear rate and you get a gap between the capability of technology and the capability of the organization to take advantage of that technology. See, most business leaders right now are like me. They're a Gen X person. Um, I think the baby boomers have gone now. I think we're just mainly just Gen X or business leaders that are left. But, you know, we, we grew up in downswing where change was particularly linear. So, you know, the MBAs and all these sorts of things were about organizational control rather than about organizational disruption. So most business leaders are really struggling right now. And certainly every leader that I talk to is battling with this, you know, this, this sort of kind of bimodal challenge of being able to, you know, can control the business whilst also completely reinventing it. So that sort of analogy of, you know, changing the engine on a, on a, on a bus that's in motion. Now, interestingly, when I talk to businesses, I'll be, and I'll be interested to know, you know, whether or not this is the sort of thing that you challenge, you have a problem with. When I talk to a number of different business leaders about what stops them from being able to take advantage of these innovations, these are the kind of barriers that I get back and, and it's on, almost reliably consistent. You know, organizations continually have a sort of very short term focused mindset. And when they talk about you know, investments in innovations, they, you know, there's a constant need to show an immediate return on investment, which creates a complete you know, fear about taking risk. If you can't deliver value from this immediately, then don't do it. And there's also this constantly quarterly pressure to meet ex analyst expectations, shareholder value expectations which means the organization ends up with a complete lack of a long-term vision. As, as an organization that has no long-term vision, it's an organization that's focused around functional control, which means we have a lot of silo behaviors, a lot of you know, silo agendas, and also, of course, silo metrics, which end up pulling the organization in different directions where each function might be successful, but the organization as a whole isn't. Um, and, and ultimately what we see is the organization really isn't playing to win, but rather playing not to lose. So I have a question for you to think about, really. Maybe we can discuss this at the end. Is, are these the sort of factors that are affecting your business or, or are you being affected by other factors that are stopping you from being innovative? See, what I see happen because of those factors is, and this is what I call the doom loop of, of short term thinking, is because you have a you know, continuous short term focus on driving shareholder value, there's an increasing pressure to demonstrate short term results, which creates a knee jerk reaction to try and cut costs which create a reduced focus on the customer innovation and longer term goals. As a result of that, people feel insecure and disconnected from the organization. Because of that, there's a reduction in integration and collaboration across functions. Because of that, there's an increasing level of trust where everything, therefore, because trust is low, everything takes a little bit longer and costs a little bit more. Because you have this sort of culture of low trust and not a lot of integration, collaboration or innovation, it really struggles to attract and retain the talent that needs to be successful in the new wave. And of course, the leaders then get very frustrated about the lack of progress. And generally what they do as a result is they, is they tighten the reins rather than release them. And it just fastens up and speeds up the doom loop. And we see this when we see the results of companies who will behave like that, but then use a digital technology or go for the silver bullets. They end up being unsuccessful. You know, anything from 84 to 90 percent of digital transformation projects fail. Well, why? Why did they fail? You know, it's basically because, you know, as it's, as um, you know, Gartner says here, they're not, you know, organizationally prepared for its adoption because they don't have a customer centric strategy. They don't have a clear why. So I'm going to focus now on seeing how do we do that? 
You see, one of my lines I say to most organizations is focus first on mindsets and then models, business models, and then focus on machines. You see, the problem with transformation is never a lack of ideas. It's actually a lack in the change in their organizational behavior. Not every organization is going to be able to use these technologies successfully. We're in this upswing right now, and it's a time when new companies thrive and win big, but it's also when the losers lose. And those who are the ones who lose will do so not because of external events, but because of their own inability to adapt to them. We see, for example, a lot of successful new startups. And why are they successful? It's not because they're able to use um, new technologies and other can't. It's because they're not weighed down by traditional thinking or their existing infrastructure. You see, successful digital transformation is actually not about technology. It is about transforming the mindset, culture, and strategy of your organization. So the what and how of technologies, and they are just what and hows, only really makes sense when they're applied to a compelling why. Most organizations need to realize that when we talk about digital, this is not a project. It doesn't have an end date. It's actually a journey, not a destination. It's a complete paradigm shift in the organization's mindset, an opportunity to redefine what it stands for, how it operates, and what it rewards. See, the line I use a lot here is that all this new wave hardware and new wave software actually requires new wave thoughtware. Here's two people whose quotes I think are very valid. I particularly like Mark Twain's quote here. And this is all about becoming uncomfortable with uncertainty. And, and I think this is true in most organizations where he says, you know, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And this is where organizations are so wedded to their existing belief system or holding on so tightly to their existing knowledge that actually they're not able to make the transition to new thinking and to new ways of operating. And I think Alvin Toffler sums it up really nicely when he says the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearning. And I think actually that unlearning is the hardest bit of all. So we nearly need to you know, embrace the unknown and don't fear it. So again, a question I want you to think about, and maybe we can discuss this at the end, is you know, is your corporate mindset an issue? Do you think your company is limiting its potential because of how it thinks? Do you think it thinks inside out, outside in, or even worse, inside in? Does it not even consider the customer in occasions? Do you think your business is conditioned by your past? Do you feel that you have different mindsets in different parts of the organization? One well, challenge I would put to you is how likely do you think there might be that a tech savvy or a non-traditional company or com well, might disrupt your industry in the next three to five years? And then think about how they could do it. How could they disrupt you? Could you disrupt yourself first? Could you actually make those changes before they get the opportunity? And do you think your organizational size and your organizational structure will be a help or a hindrance to that disruption? Now, I'm going to give you some, let's, let's look at how the winners are doing this. So interestingly, Gartner has a supply chain top 25 company um, thing it releases every year. And this is the last one it did there, 2021. Um, ignore the fact I circled Nestle it was because I was dealing with one of their competitors the other day. Um, I shouldn't have circled it. But let's look at the top five. The top five here, Amazon, Apple, McDonald's, P&G and Unilever. They are the top five supply chain masters in the world. And they're also some of the most valuable and the most successful organizations in the world. Interestingly, when Gartner um, analyzed those different companies and looked at those masters, it said, what are the things that they're able to differentiate them? Why are they the masters and why did they stay in that position? And there was three things that come out. They were purpose driven. They were business model transformers and they were digital orchestrators. And there's a little bit of text there that you can look at the video to read. But basically, if you sum that down to just a, a one soundbite, they focused on long term value, not short term profit and cost cutting. They created new agile business models using supply chain as an enabler to those business models. And they understood very clearly how to use digital to accelerate the business models flywheel. Now, interestingly, and quite pleasing for me, those were exactly the three things that I talk about in the two chapters of my book, Transition Point. So if you do get hold of those books, look at chapter 13, chapter 14, and it does go through exactly those things. So that I wrote that back in 2018. So it was quite pleasing to see that they were talking about exactly those two things there. So a little bit of self-promotion. The trouble is, of course, most companies are completely unsure of their why. They certainly don't think about business models and they don't know how they're going to use these digital technologies, but they go ahead anyway. So let's start with purpose driven. What does it mean to be purpose driven? 
Well, it means you understand exactly why you exist. You understand what customer jobs you're trying to solve and why you're trying to solve them. And you should have a purpose that stands the test of time and not be linked to an individual product or an individual service that could effectively be replaced. And this is a mistake that a lot of organizations have made. They've, they've you know, they believe that their product is their, their, you know, their rationale. It's not. And if you get your purpose right, then you should be able to create focus on creating business models based around your purpose that look at disruptive tools as potentially new and better ways to serve that purpose rather than looking at them as a threat. Here's a company who's doing exactly that. So Unilever, I heard Unilever talk back in 2010, where they said after the um, after the financial crash and when most companies were focused on cost cutting, they weren't going to do that. They realized that was the wrong thing to do. It wasn't purpose driven, it wasn't customer driven, and they were actually gonna redesign themselves around a sustainability purpose and around customer focused business models and customer focused value chains. So they were saying they were focusing on value, not on cost cutting. And the interesting thing they said in 2010 was that they were noticing that they were saving more costs by focusing on value than when they were focusing on cost cutting. Now, interestingly, back in February, they, they were, a report came out that said they had cut costs by 1.5 billion over the long term by not focusing on cost cutting in the short term, but focusing on their purpose and focusing on their value. And I thought that was really interesting, you know, um, approval of this mindset, if you can think long term. Let's look at two companies that couldn't do it. Great examples. I think these are, and, and, and I'm using them because you all know them. Kodak. Kodak was an, an incredibly innovative organization whose brand was called having Kodak Moments. Kodak Moment was the capturing of a memory and the sharing it with friends. Kodak kind of forgot that. Kodak then realized that actually it made a lot of money from film and it focused its entire business model around its product, film. Even though Kodak engineers developed the digital cameras and tried very hard to get the C-level, um, the C-suite to understand that digital was the future, they kept looking at the profitable sales they were making from film and for the, they saw digital purely as a threat to their existing products, not as a new way to help people capture and share memories. And of course, Kodak has uh, departed and Instagram, which was now owned by Facebook, is the way that we capture and share memories. Blockbuster is another great example. Blockbuster was you know, famous around the world as where we went for home entertainment, but it forgot that its purpose was to provide home entertainment and thought it was business was to provide videos and DVDs. And the moment there was a better way of providing home entertainment via things like Netflix, Blockbuster was irrelevant. Blockbuster actually had the chance to buy Netflix for 50 million and turned it down because it didn't see the value. Seems ironic in hindsight. And of course, when you look now at those two organizations who are both now defunct in, in their format, Kodak still exists, but not in, in the, certainly in the film industry or in the digital imagery industry, no amount of efficiency drives or supply chain rationalization or cost cutting or new product innovations around their areas would have saved Blockbuster or Kodak. They were both the dominant global leaders in their respective industries. And people now watch more home entertainment and take more photos than at any point in history. So it's not that the market collapsed. In fact, it's grown, but neither Kodak or Blockbuster is involved in it in any meaningful way because they forgot their purpose and someone else used all of this new technology to serve their customer needs better. So businesses need to have a Copernican business revolution. They need to stop thinking of themselves as being at the center of the universe and the customer circles them and realize that the consumer or the customer is at the center of the universe and they need to circle it. And this is a really big mindset shift for most companies to make. Now, how do you do that? You need to do four major primary mindset shifts and a structural shift. So you need to become customer centric, not the third centric. You need to focus on value creation, not cost cutting. You need to focus on problem solving, not product selling. And you need to think about competing business models, not just competing products. And then you need to have a structural shift, which means you need to have segmented, strategically aligned end to end value chains and not competing vertical functions. So let's quickly go through each one of those. Talk about, um, go back to which one, customer centric over firm centric. It's been said for some long that you know the, what customers actually want is a, you know is is not a quarter inch drill bit. It's actually a quarter inch hole. But what we sell, what companies sell, is this. This is what we sell, and this is what we buy. We buy toolkits, and in fact, a very interesting statistic is that a drill over the lifetime that it's owned by most people is used. I think the the average is 18 minutes. It has 18 minutes of active use from the moment a consumer buys a drill to the moment they dispose of it. 
because that's not what customers actually want. They don't want to drill. What they want is a hole, or so you'd believe. But of course they don't. No one wants holes in their walls. What people actually want is to you know, hang a mirror, put a shelf up, do different things. The real job to be done is actually not put holes in our walls, but actually to hang things or, or assemble things. Now, if you can find a way that actually does that without putting holes in your walls, not only are you going to disrupt the drill bit industry and the drill industry, but you're going to delight your customer. The way to do this is to focus on what your business, your customers in. Be in the business of your customers. So I'm going to give you very quickly two case studies. And I know there's someone on the audience who actually was with me on one of these things who, who will remember it quite clearly. Um, one of the heavy, we've talked about aerospace, but um, I work for an organization um, that was very heavy into um, armored vehicles. Um, they thought they were in the spares and repairs business. In fact, their whole business was predicated around uh, management of spares and management of, and the heavy manufacturing and also in repairs. Of course, the customer doesn't want spares and it doesn't want repairs. What it actually wants is operational vehicles and it wants to know if a vehicle's broken, when is it going to be operational again? But the business was actually completely predicated around making money from spares and repairs. So it ran completely contrary to what the customer actually wanted. And another personal example of a company I work with that couldn't make the change, it tried. It was in, um, in long steel. It thought it was in the steel business. Its entire business was predicated around increasing the throughput and the efficiency of its steel mills. But it isn't in the steel business. It's actually in the construction business. And actually, if it understood that, then it would not so focus on making, you know, un un running its steel mills and making sure they run continuously, but actually focusing on making sure that it delivers steel in a reliable fashion, because if the steel is late, then this multi-billion pound or million pound construction project is going to be late. So it doesn't matter how good your steel is, no one's going to buy it because the cost to the organization of a delay in the delivery of steel is too much to, pay, to take. And of course, the impact of that is that cost of you know complacency, the cost of not complacency, that's not a very good headline. But it's, you know, let's take those organizations. The result of being firm-centric, not customer-centric, is you don't win the contract. Your customer very quickly realizes that you don't have their best interests at heart, you have your own best interests at heart, and the impact of that can be quite devastating for the areas that are focusing on that for jobs. And again, another one there with the steel. You know, again, I was unfortunate, I couldn't get them to change in time. And of course, you end up seeing areas like Scumfort, where I used to live, for example, being completely devastated because you know it's the major employer in town. In both these cases, it was the organization's own leadership and culture that ensured its failure and not external factors. They will blame external factors till the cows come home, but it was a choice. It was a choice that they made not to be successful because they didn't focus on what the customer valued. Let's look at a company that does focus on what the customer valued. Let's talk about Amazon, an organization you all know. They have a very clear culture. Their culture is based around customer obsession. It is a culture that continually innovates and it is a culture that also relentlessly executes. Innovation has no value unless it can be delivered. Ideas are a commodity. Execution is not. Amazon strips it down really quite simply. It says we have three big ideas at Amazon that we've stuck with for the last 18 years and they're the reason we're successful. And this was said a few years ago. Put the customer first, invent, be patient. What's he actually really saying here? Being completely customer centric, being innovation focused, being long term, has a, have a long term vision. So this is from their shareholder report. It's from their 1997 shareholder report and they issue this every year. So the initial shareholder report that Amazon delivered when they first went live, when they first had the IPO and their current one gets delivered in tandem for a reason. The reason is we are still sticking to our purpose. We are still sticking to our principles and the principles are this. We will continue to focus relentlessly on our customers. We will continue to make investment decisions in light of the long term market leadership considerations rather than short term profitability considerations and short term Wall Street. And if you remember, Amazon was dismissed for almost a decade as a company that will never make a profit. It seems ridiculous now, but for a decade, Wall Street said Amazon is not a good bet. We will make bold rather than timid investment decisions where we see sufficient probability of gaining market leadership advantages. Some of these investments will pay off, others will not. And we will have learned another valuable lesson in either case. So it's talking about risk taking there and the ability to take risks. We will continue to focus on hiring and retaining versatile and talented employees and continue to weight their compensation to stock options rather than cash. 
And we know our success will be largely affected by our ability to attract and retain a motivated employee base, each of whom must think like and therefore must actually be an owner of the business. So what are we talking about there? We're talking about customer centricity, having a long term focus, a culture of constant innovation and experimentation where you're encouraged to take risks and you don't get hit for being fa for failing and a team of entrepreneurs. Now, they bake in this culture. Really interesting, I was describing this on a session I did recently. If you look at how an MBA or someone will teach you how to develop a culture and you look at Amazon's culture, you will never see those two together. Amazon did not see anything that reflected the kind of cultural leadership lessons it needed, so it built its own. It knew in order to innovate the way it innovates and in order to develop its customer centricity that it needed to, it had to create an entire of rules and, and religions within its organization. And one of these is really interesting. There's a whole host that I talk about, but this is why a particularly interesting one, which is in every single meeting Amazon has, and that is not a picture of an Amazon meeting, I just want to point that out, but there is an empty chair. And that empty chair represents the customer because Jeff Bezos very clearly said, we want the customer to have a voice in everything that we decide. You know, we want him to understand what would we say? And the reason for that is that it stops them from being firm centric. It stops them from not putting the blinkers on and thinking only about themselves and their internal profitability and actually always consider whether or not this is going to delight the customer. So I have a couple of questions for you to think about, really. What would your customers say about most of your discussions if they were in the room at the time? And would they believe that they had a voice in most of the decisions that you actually make? So I'd like you to think about that. Now, of course, Amazon's ability to keep that culture and behave in the way it is means that its competitors now have a choice. They can either disrupt themselves, like a companies like Ocado, which everyone thought Amazon was going to wipe out, but it completely changed its business to become incredibly tech focused and now actually makes more money through um, designing robotic warehouse systems and automation systems for other retailers like um, you know, M&S and for um, Kroger over in the States, or ultimately, if you can't shift, you just die. So Sears, which was called the original everything store because it sold pretty much everything, you know, has gone bankrupt. The way to do this is to focus on what the actual customer's job to be done is, and then how to help them succeed in the job. So again, you need to understand who makes the decision whether or not to buy your goods or services. What is the actual job that they're trying to do? Who are their customers? So who is your customer's customers? And can you help your customers be successful for them? Who else is competing to do that job? Who competes to do that job now? And who's competing to do that job in the future? And does this whole raft of digital technology and automation that I took you through enable that job to be done in more convenient ways or without barriers? Now, one thing to be very clear is that innovation doesn't have to be about technology. New business models can arise that simply put the customer, not the company first. Innovation can come from identifying excessive waste or cost to the customer or by removing barriers and inconveniences. It can come from streamlining a process by digitizing it or by removing costs or barriers by servitizing it or eliminating you know, poor service or banal products by personalizing it. And in fact, you can reinvent very boring and traditional markets that are just completely saturated with bad innovations based around you know, more functionality, and more features. And they can prove to be very lucrative if you can do that. Putting the customer at the heart of your business and your marketing plan means that very, very small startups and the very Davids of the business world can take on even the biggest Goliaths. And I'd like to give you a great example here in a moment. See, sometimes huge opportunity comes from simplification from addressing needs and solving problems rather than selling products, simplifying the solution. So I'm gonna give you an, uh, think of an example where a company simplified a product and doing so attracted a huge market. I'm gonna give you a great one here. So this is Procter & Gamble, biggest organization on the planet in the consumer goods industries, being having its most profitable product segment completely disrupted and by a company that was set up in 2012 by one guy. So if you remember, and, and still very much true today, the shaving industry, men's shaving, was all about bad innovation. It was about you know putting extra strips and things like this. And the customer felt completely undisturbed. In loads of headlines around, you know, the price of blades have soared up by 99% in just three years. You know, they were making increasing levels of profit from the consumer. And it was ripe for disruption. 
because their innovation was getting a bit ridiculous. It was getting to the point where actually you couldn't even do the job. So one of the companies that I worked for developed a razor to solve the problem that they created because they put too many blades on the razor and you couldn't have a proper shave anymore. You couldn't get the little bit under your nose. So they had to have a little flip trick. So the innovations were solving problems that they created, you know, really lost sight of the customer until guys like this came along. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. One video attacking the biggest market, most profitable market in the US, and things like Blaze Blades from some of the biggest companies in the world, and it completely disrupted it. In fact, Unilever had been trying to get into the shaving market for decades, bought Dollar Shave Club four years after that video came out for one billion. The, that guy was talking to you right then in these operation. That was the operation where he set up, but four years later, he sold it for a billion. Gillette obviously didn't have a market there. The, uh, so Gillette, sorry, had 60% share of the market, but they were stuck now. They're stuck because of their incumbent position. They tried to do their own version of it, but they maintained their margins and they, therefore they were a lot more expensive. They stopped short of disrupting themselves and Unilever was able to jump straight into this market by acquiring Dollar Shave Club. And in fact, companies that looked at this said, you know, Dollar, buying Dollar Shave Club is a bold bet, requires huge convictions, gives them digital skills, talents, and assets. Dollar Shave Club is a technology enabled company but actually what its real value was, it spoke directly to consumer and it delivered directly to consumer. Whereas, you know, P&G and the other competitors like Edgewell were dealing purely with the car fours and the Walmarts and the Tesco's, they were going straight to the customer and the consumer was almost irrelevant. They were just making money off them at the end of the day and completely avoided them until a small startup took most of their business away. And in fact, when they tried to then catch up, so P&G and Edgewell, who own Schick and Wilson Sword, they couldn't. So Gillette was bleeding market share, lost anything up to 70% of his market share in 2010. Edgewell tried to buy another subscription market because the moment Dollar Shave Club become a, became a profitable market, other companies like Harry's came into the game. And, he, and they tried to acquire Harry's, but they couldn't because, again, the FTC said, no, you can't. We don't like this. You're destroying the competition. And all they're seeing now is the incredibly profitable business model and the incredibly profitable market just disappear in front of their eyes. So let's go on to value creation over cost cutting. Different, thinking different. Businesses have a choice. You have a choice to grow their slice, like you know P and G and Edwell and all these razor companies do, or you can grow the pie. You can create whole new business models, unique products and services, innovation products, differentiated service operatings. So again, a question for you: Does your company focus on trying to protect or grow its individual slice of the market, or are you looking at growing your pie? Here's a quick example: a company I used to work for that had was focusing completely on very firm centric innovations. Cadbury's, you know, got taken over by Kraft. Kraft organization was very much focused on cost cutting and driving down value. And, and of course the consumer noticed, it noticed very much, it, you know, all the headlines were about, you know, the change in the, in the quality of the product, the, the cheapening of the product, the fact that there was less chocolate, the fact that it tastes terrible now, and even the removal of things like this fair trade purpose, it was core to who Cadbury's used to be. But they're starting to get it now. 
So now they're starting to make sort of much more customer centric innovations and intelligently, if they get it right, they're still sort of saving the same sort of cost they were trying to save when they didn't consider the customer, but the customer is delighted by it. So the price, for example, in this, in this house here, which was released for Christmas, is far more than the, comp the components were sold independently. But the value from a customer perspective is much greater because they enjoy the experience, not just the chocolate. So they're making more profit and save more cost by focusing on value generation. And in fact, if the customer's delighted by this value generation, then it doesn't care if you do the same thing again and repackage it. And they've done exactly that by moving the Christmas cottage into an Easter cottage. And it cost £16 and they sold out immediately because the customer you know, values the experience and it isn't just seen as being about the firm. So we have a mix between good complexity and bad complexity. Good complexity is complexity that adds value to the customer and delivers results to the business that exceeds the additional cost of the complexity. And it drives incremental sales and volumes that exceed the incremental expenses and concerns or results in a favorable shift. Bad complexity, on the other hand, confuses the customer or destroys value or cannibalizes existing sales. It erodes profit, increases inventory, and generally makes the supply chain less agile. There is good money to be had from you know, innovating boring things. Think about Dyson. Dyson was went into a market where the product was completely commoditized, and one company, Hoover, was synonymous with the action of actually doing the activity, hoovering, but it moved in and it completely changed the paradigm. It realized quite quickly that something that other companies didn't, that actually people like knowing that their product works. So they created this new invention, the turbine sort of um, vacuum cleaner, and they realized that actually people like seeing the muck, whereas you know Hoover, for example, carried it away in bags. And they also challenge a number of preconceived beliefs in old thinking. And this is one of the really important pieces for you to think about. The, what you think is true is probably not. You know, the idea that a commodity like a hairdryer that generally sells for £17.99 to £30 could actually sell for £300 and people would queue up to buy it and it could be gifted as a Christmas present, would most people wouldn't believe that's true. Well, because it is. And we now see, you know, Dyson hairdryers that go for £300 with, you know, a huge number of customers all giving it four to five stars. Now, one of the other things you need to focus on is problem selling, not product selling. What do I mean by that? So I mean thinking about solutions, because if you just tell about, you know, your marketing is predicated around your products, people aren't interested. But if you can show how you can solve their problems, then you can actually delight them. Here's, an, here's the mindset of a digital problem solver. So in America, they have a really big problem with what they call porch pirates, or as I like to call them, thieving bastards who go around, followed like the UPS truck or the FedEx truck, and basically wait for parcels to be delivered and steal them. And it's a really major problem across America, the theft. It causes a major problem for all of the e-commerce retailers as well, because the customer doesn't get their goods. Every other retailer didn't see it was their problem to solve. Amazon thought by solving that problem, it could actually open up home new business models. <laughs> You already know Amazon is the easiest way to get what you need. Like gifts for people whose birthday you've forgotten. As an Amazon Prime member, you'll now be able to use Amazon Key, a new service that enables in-home and in-car delivery. Maybe you just learned you have to join your parents for a fancy dinner immediately after work, and you're wearing the shirt you woke up in. With Amazon Key in-car, all you need is a compatible vehicle, and you can have that new shirt you just bought delivered directly inside your car at no extra cost. But it's much more than delivery. With the Amazon Key app, you can also grant access to the people you trust. Let's say you need to remotely manage guest access to the front door of your home. Maybe to let in your dog walker, a friend, or a team of home cleaning ninjas. To get started with in-home delivery and keyless guest entry, order the Amazon Key Home Kit, which includes Amazon Cloud Cam and one of several compatible smart locks. Have it installed by a pro, or if you're handy, install it yourself. For in-car delivery, simply download the Amazon Key app and link it with your connected car system. No additional hardware or devices required.
After that, start ordering on Amazon.com and have your packages delivered inside your vehicle when parked at home, work, or near other locations in your address book. With Amazon Key In-Home, you can track your delivery with real-time notifications, watch the delivery happening live, or review a video of the delivery after it's complete. And with Amazon Key In-Car, you'll know when the delivery is on its way and when the package has been delivered and your car has been relocked. Maybe you don't want your packages sitting out on display. Maybe rain is in the forecast. Or maybe you just need your mom's gift moments before she walks through the door. You know, because you're awesome. So let's think about what Amazon has just done there. It's solved the problem that no one was asking it to solve. But in solving that problem, it's created massive new business opportunities. So what it's actually done, and you will it even it didn't mention it explicitly, so it didn't say, hey, we're going to solve the porch pirate problem. It's created a solution that added value to the customers. But in doing that, it opened up a whole new market. So coincidentally, just after it did that, most people didn't notice, it went straight into the house cleaning business, doing deep cleaning, carpet cleaning, pressure washing, because now it has access to your door. You can, you can enable people to come in and do these sorts of services. But it was quietly showing you what could be possible because it's actually now allowed it to enter entire new markets. See, solving the porch piracy problem rather than ignoring it and assuming there was nothing they could do to solve it created five brand new business opportunities. It allowed Amazon to develop and sell a whole new range of tech products because it's a tech manufacturer. And they opened the door, pun intended, to a whole new acquisition opportunity. It positioned Amazon as the default supplier of e-commerce goods to consumers due to be able to safely secure their deliveries, whereas other companies couldn't. It reduced its replacement claims and costs and created happier customers. It creates massive amounts of data, and this is absolutely its focus about who its consumers are, that it can feed into its algorithms and help them better understand and serve their needs. But it also opened the door, again, pun intended, to completely new business models and positioned itself as a provider of choice for industry sectors that previously was not involved in, such as home services. That's the way Amazon thinks, and that's the way really you need to start to think to be successful in this way. In fact, Amazon is now so good at developing customer-centric business models, it constantly refines the art of the possible, creates enormous new markets by delighting customers, by meeting their unrecognized needs, removing inconveniences, and solving problems that they didn't even know were solvable. No one was asking for Amazon to create a device that you could just talk to and order goods from, but it did. No one was asking Amazon to create stores that you could just walk out with that and not queue and not pay for your goods, but it did. In fact, most people didn't even think that was possible, but Amazon did it. Now, Amazon also sells that tech now, that just walk out technology to every other retailer, creating a huge and massively profitable business model. So it's all about the business models, create competing business models, not just competing products. We have moved from a world where companies and brands and products compete to where my colleague at Cranfield, Martin Christopher, said supply chain competes around 2001. We haven't. We've gone beyond that now to where business models compete. That is the new way of thinking. Take Blockbuster versus Netflix, the, advanced, the example I gave you earlier. Blockbuster was not a not was not a non-innovative company. It was an incredibly innovative company, but it innovated within its own business model. It offered new offerings such as video game rentals, video game purchases, and other supplementary sales. It did a whole lot of innovation, but stuck within the paradigm of the physical store. Netflix just then created a whole new business model. Firstly, by allowing people to deliver films, because the biggest inconvenience with the physical store model was I had to return the film or the game, else I got fined. So it took away that massive consumer inconvenience initially by postage, but now by using digital technology, because its focus is on delivering value, delivering the actual purpose, not about its physical product. When you design your business models for success, you need to be focusing on, you know, customer centric, consumer centric ones, not just product centric ones. Real clarity about where you're going to play, what are the different customer segments in your business, who are the consumers, what are their jobs to be done, and what channels do they use or they could use with these new technologies, and how will you win? What new and unique value propositions can you deliver? Who else competes in this job now and in the future? Can you exploit your competitors' weaknesses and neutralize their strengths? And how do you strategically align your operations to deliver these value propositions? See, this is, this is my version of a business model. So we're really about talking about having a very clarified, defined customer segment, understanding what our unique value proposition is going to be to them, and then having a strategically aligned set of execution capabilities 
where we've got to understand what our channels are, where the demand comes through and our communication comes through, where we develop the processes to develop that unique value proposition, our design, our build, and our supply chain network that delivers the cup to the customer. On the, on the right-hand side, we have our cost structures. On the left-hand side, we have our revenue streams. So we're bringing together who, with why, what, and how. And I'm doing this at speed, I know. The key for the, 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 the operational bit is that structure should always follow your strategy. That, that's a problem for most organizations because they don't know what their strategy is. But once you understand what your strategy is for each business model, set up your organizational team structure to deliver that strategy. Is that your supply chain network to deliver that strategy? Set your, your performance metrics to deliver that strategy. Design your processes to deliver that strategy. Design your behaviors and skills to deliver the strategy. And then these new technologies that we've been talking about set them up and use them specifically to see whether or not they enhance the delivery. If they don't, ignore them, they're noise. If they do, embrace them. Don't just think about these new technologies as ways to automate existing jobs. That's very much a fifth wave mindset. Think about how they could be used to innovate your business models. Could you use them to create new opportunities, new supply chain works, new channels, new value propositions, new business models? Could you use them to help increase the effectiveness of value adding processes? either by increasing reliability, responsiveness, sustainability, or reallocating effort to value adding tasks, or just removing barriers to value? Could it be used to automate or improve the efficiency of value enabling processes, processes such as payroll or finance or order processing or accounts receivable, et cetera? Or could they be used to remove non-value adding processes, eliminate human waste, cost, risks, and error? So you can look at all the technologies I went through at the start, and say, you know, can we use these? And if not, ignore them, they're not valuable. So could tools like RPA, chatbots and digital assistants remove non-value adding clerical administrative assistance or improve data accuracy? Could the IoT and digital twins be used to simulate the supply chain, tracking asset performance, et cetera, et cetera? How could you disrupt your industry with these new technologies? Could you create service innovations that enable you to reach new customer segments or provide more reliable, responsive 24-7 service? Could you create more compelling or personal experiences or more personal communications or better engagement with your company or product? Could you use those new technologies to create product innovations, to create radically new solutions for your business model, digitize your value proposition, servitize it, premiumize it, personalize it, create more sustainable solutions? Could you use it to innovate your network? based around your strategy, create more local, agile or flexible, depending on what your strategy needs, more reliable, more responsive, more efficient delivery mechanisms, less inventory and less locations, use things like modular manufacturing to do more on-demand manufacturing. Or could you even use it just in the process areas, things like RPA to eliminate human errors, create more accurate plans or schedules, more error-free processing, safer ways of working, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see, the digital skills, we need digital skills for a digital wave. In our machine world, our uniquely human skills will become more crucially important. Old jobs that are structured, repeatable, rules-based and predictable, they're going to be automated. Machines are going to beat you every single day of the week on that one. New jobs, however, are going to be around creating value, design, creativity, inquiry, inspiration, creation, empathy. All of these very, very human skills, collaboration, adaptability, reason, problem solving, things that machines can't do, or at least can't do it for now. And this is really important that we actually have you know, our education system geared up for this. If we train our children simply to compete against the machines, we are training them to lose. So we must teach them new digital focus skills to compete in this new digital wave. So I'll summarize really, we're looking at this. So in the, this is the shift that needs to take place in your culture to become much more innovative. We need Our goals need to move from maximizing value for shareholders, protect the market slices and putting our firm first to maximizing value for stakeholders, growing the pie or baking new pies and putting the consumer and customer first. Our organizational structure needs to move from the top down, instruction from above, command, control, Frederick Winslow, Taylor, focus on having efficiency in our functions to being able to capture ideas from anywhere, empowering and enabling people and creating agile cross-process end-to-end value chain teams, these sort of T-shaped teams. Our business mindset needs to move from being activity focused and measured to being fixed mindset and, and product selling and cost control to actually being about outcome focus and, and being measured around growth, problem solving and value creation. And our culture needs to move in around adherence to rules, existing knowledge and experience, avoiding risks and paying not to lose, to move to giving people freedom to challenge and take risks, to be able to inquire and be creative, to embrace experimentation and to play to win. So the challenge for you people in the audience now is to think like a startup. Here's a question I'd like you to think about. 
if you had to build your company today, knowing what is possible, knowing how people engage with technology, how they behave and what they expect, would your company resemble anything that it looks like today? What new parts of the business would you develop and what parts would you change and what parts would you get rid of? Would you hire the same people or would you hire new ones? And then questions really I want you to think about is what's stopping you making these changes? What existing assets or existing mindsets are holding you back? See, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Doing nothing is no longer an option. So start by thinking big, start small, pilot, do things, but scale and fail fast. Thank you very much. My name is Mark Day. I work from, for Alexander Dennis. Uh, we build uh, double-decker buses. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think one of the challenges that we have in a business is that transfer of job roles. Mostly at the moment, our company is set up as business as usual roles, mm. i.e. they've got a job to do, they've got to process invoices. Whereas we don't have many people in the organisation that are working on improving. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you've had in the customers you've worked with, have you had many challenges of making that transition? So you've got more people working on a, an improvement basis and less people doing business as usual? Yeah, I think that, that's probably the biggest challenge most organisations face in this way. And, and a lot of organisations get it wrong. Um, they, for example, one of the big things that a lot of companies try to do is, you know, they, they realise that they've got to deliver. So you've got to execute on the current business. You've got to be able to, as you say, you've got to meet your current commitments. You've got to be able to deliver what you do right now. Um, and, and they realise that they potentially um, would struggle to be disruptive in their own organisational culture. So what a lot of companies have done is actually they've created innovation hubs or skunk works, never little businesses on the side of their business that enables them to 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 think wild to think big to put bean bags and post-its everywhere and to be really creative and then they really struggle with bringing that back into the normal organization because the normal organization hasn't changed and it still has the same cultural mindsets and the same cultural behaviors so um, even companies like you know businesses like airbus where work with you know have got huge organizations that do some very big projects around you know autonomous planes and drones and these sorts of things but then when i looked into them before i did the work with them the project would end and nothing would happen. It, 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 so they proved the concept, but they couldn't operationalize it. And I think you're right that the, the biggest challenge for a lot of organizations is, is firstly changing its mindset and changing its behaviors. And second, being able to operationalize the, the new innovations and the new ideas that can come out. I'm, I'm, a, I'm very anti, uh, even for, it's very strange for a consultant, but to say it's very anti-consultancy, but I'm very anti-consultancy generally because a lot of the times the business um, divorces itself of the responsibility of the thinking process when actually that you will find that the talent within the organization actually has 101 different ways that they can improve that organization but they're generally not asked how to do that and I think you know certainly my the way I operate is to try and tap into that latent talent as much as possible but then I think there is also the, the challenge in a lot of businesses that companies are so scared that this sounds like a threat to my job this sounds like you know, either either directly, you know, I, you're talking about automating what I do right now, or indirectly by saying, I feel uncomfortable because this new wave of change is bringing new skills to the table and, and new ways of working that I don't know. And therefore, I've gone from feeling very comfortable and I know how to do my job into very uncomfortable because actually I'm, I'm concerned that I might not have the capabilities. So I think it, it's probably the most challenging area for a business to to attack and it has to start at the top. It has to come, this, this culture has to come from the top. And I'll use an example. Um, I, I did a round table in Berlin a few years ago, um, looking at why companies struggle to, or to, to be innovative and to change their culture. And, and the sort of things that came out were the things I used in that presentation, you know, playing not to lose rather than playing to win, focus on the short term, all of this sort of stuff. And I had a senior manager from Amazon on the table. And, and I said to him at the time, I said, you know, were you lost? Did you, well, why have you come to this table talking about why you're struggling um, to, to be um, innovative? And he said, well, I was really interesting in, um, in finding out what other companies said. And, and he listened. And when he got to him, I said, well, can, can you share your problems that you have at Amazon? And he said, the, problem I have, the biggest problem we have at Amazon is recruiting people from all of these other organizations. 
and, and he said, um, you know, and there were people at the table were from Ford and Toyota and Phillips and and you know and other organisations like that. He said, we 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 employ very well educated, um, very well experienced, very credible people who've got very high leadership roles, and they're useless. He said, they're, they're in fact they're worse than useless to us. They they are bottlenecks very quickly because they would have been taught not to take risks they have been taught mm. not to drop the ball and he said yeah. when we come into our organizations and we tell them to take risks they don't believe it and they, they they maybe become able to take very small risks but not only are they themselves not able to take risks they are they create a culture beneath them where the people underneath them are not taking risks either so he said they we find that we can't deprogram them and actually they don't not only do we not get the value we should do from them they destroy value from the team that actually reports into them so i, I thought that was very interesting that the the difference in the culture between the companies that are being successful like amazon and the other ones you know are, are really because of the way people have been taught to behave so i think i think you're right i think it is it's the biggest challenge for most organizations to face and i don't know many companies necessarily that get it right other than the ones that are able to really do the things that i talked about there which was to completely think about how the businesses uh, uh, customers are what they value and to become much more segmented okay well at least that's reassuring that we're not the only ones facing that <laughs> no, challenge no, you're, you're, you're not but but it's that but it's but it's, I, I would a I, warning it this this is incredibly dangerous times for those companies that can't make the shift um, you know, you are in. You say you're a bus manufacturer, but really you're in the transportation business. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and the transportation world is changing dramatically right now, um, and it's moving very much from. from you know, and, and it could be a very good time for you. But, you know, uh, autonomous buses are and electric buses are both two yeah. things that we're going to see moving forwards. Um, so I think you know, if you if you put yourself in the in the transportation business and think about what how transportation is changing rather than in the, the bus business. And then get your organization to work about how transportation as a service could emerge and how you can service that industry. I think you'd be in the right place. I, I think some of some of the things I picked up we do quite well. Uh, you know, you talked about having a spare chair for the customer. We, we have our customers at our senior management conferences. Obviously, mm -hmm. we don't have them now because of COVID, but you know, there are some things that I've picked up out what you said that we are doing well. Um, and I said it was just just that mindset challenge that I've been working on at the moment. But yeah, that was really good. Thank you. My pleasure. Just a quick question, Sean. When when we're quite often getting involved in ERP projects that our customers yep. have, they've obviously got a bit, you know, a digital transformation project underway. Yep. Um, and as you quite often, as you quite rightly say, you know, they, they put together a team, they try and think outside the box, but then quite often. As, as part of putting the new ERP system in or, or making changes to, to, to their sort of back end systems. Once the project's finished and the job's done, they just stop all of that innovation. And, it, you know, the, the thinking that was being done outside the box just seems to come to a standstill. So from the companies who you've dealt with, how, how do they sort of keep that innovation going forwards? I mean, my background's ERP. Um, you know, I, I started working with SAP in the early 90s um, and, 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 you know, then, double digit number of SAP implementations. And you're absolutely right. One of my big beefs is that a company will think very hard about how it thinks this ERP implementation is going to deliver value in order to create the business case that gives them permission to proceed and make the investment and never and hardly ever goes back to say, does that did we deliver any of the things that we said this would deliver in our business case? And the pro and the and the, one of the other big issues is a lot of the times the project is seen as being an IT project rather than a business transformation project. And then the, therefore the implementation and the go live becomes the end of the project when in fact it's a start. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and you, if you look at, and I've done a number of white papers on this back in the late 90s, early 2010s, I think, um, where I talk about, um, you know, getting, a, a, you know, we, we organizations have a small R and a big I to get a little, you know, little return and big, but big investment. Um, and that's because if you look between the difference between the leaders and the laggards, the leaders look at it as a way to enable business transformation and the laggards look at it as a way to change their technical, their IT systems. And, and the problems that existed at the start of the ERP implementation probably exist. And what that ERP implementation, and you will probably know this, does is amplify it. It exposes a lot of bad practices in the organization. And then they'll blame the technology because, you know, the, uh, things like ATP, for example, you know, will highlight the fact that your inventory is out of control, that you haven't got, you know, your schedule and dates on your purchase orders are out of date, your, your delivery dates on your customer orders aren't right and, and all of these sorts of information. And they blame the system. But really what it's done is expose the fact that they're not in control. 
companies that are successful are the ones that look at the ERP system as an opportunity to gain control so that they can start to then improve and start to innovate. The ones that aren't successful that look at it as much more as a technological perspective where the, the go live is the end of the project. They have cake and a party and they pat themselves on the back and then that's, and, and as you rightly say, they then go back to business as usual. And, and the only thing that's changed is probably the colour of the screens that they're using. Yeah, exactly. So in, in the in the Amazons, do you think, how, how do they, in, in companies like that and Netflix, what sort of teams do you think they have constantly running looking at innovation? They do. They they they, they segment um, massively. And one of, I mean, if I had more time, I would have gone through this and I'd do this in my master classes. Amazon has a principle called the two pizza principle, for example. If, if a team can't be fed with two pizzas, it's too big. So and, and that basically realizes that the larger the team, the more management gets involved. And the more management gets involved, the more things slow down and gets and, and managers focus on activity management rather than creativity and um, Interestingly, I, I, I'm quite good friends with one of the senior people at J&J &J who used to be running this sort of what they call their fast and light program at Amazon, which was stuff that had to be delivered very quickly, but didn't weigh very much. So it's um, phone charger cables, those sorts of things. And he, he used to talk about Jeff Bezos would always say, you know, they come up and say, Jeff, we can't do this, for example. We can't deliver these items profitably to customers um, next day. It just can't be done. And, and Jeff Bezos' mindset would be, I believe you can do it. Slap him on the back and, and shake get on with it. Which was this permission to go ahead. But but it's also a statement of saying you need to think harder, you know, and, and try harder. And you can and it doesn't matter what it costs, but you can do it. You know, within reason, of course. But and, and Amazon, you know, quite famously has failed. It failed quite a lot, a number of different things. It failed its mobile phone, it's done a number of things which didn't succeed. But it doesn't shoot the person that fails or shoot the team that fails. It actually rewards them because we tried something that didn't work. Never mind. We now know, to use you know, Thomas Edison's mindset, we now know a way not to make a light bulb. We've learned from that experience, but we probably captured some really important insights and some really important data that we can use when we move forward. So, you know, segmented end-to-end -end value chain teams that, in, that align behaviors, metrics, and practices from procurement all the way through to effectively product disposal so the, the disposal for example is contained in the design process for, so we're thinking not just about what to make but even how to get rid of it and how it goes through the supply chain and how it's going to be displayed in the stores and all of the elements are basically joined up around delivering that single value proposition and then when you look at new technologies the team comes to bever and say well how does it help us do you know communicate with the customer how does it help us store the product how does it help us what you know where is the potential opportunity in the value chain rather than just in that one particular function and that's why they're so successful okay anything else kelly oh she's on mute yes have you seen the the question in the chat can you see the chat window oh, hang on can i see the chat window? Well, martin krangle so oh yeah that was a question from that guy the one who had to leave who wants to know which three 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 jobs to choose <laughs> which three careers yeah. Say that again. I missed the question. Well, I missed Martin's question there. So Martin had a question. Hang on a minute. Can I bring up the chat just a minute? Uh, where's it gone? Show conversations. So the question was, uh, it was very, very complimentary. Say it was, it was like listening to Pele talking about football. So <laughs> that, that was good. Um, and his question was, if you could offer any careers advice to a school leaver, what three careers would you suggest today? Oh, gosh. That's it. I mean, the trouble is it's moving so quickly. So right now, I mean, data's hot, isn't it? I mean, any, any data scientists, data analysts, um, any any combination of mathematics, statistics, and um, you know, analysis is is really hot right now. It's commanding quite a high premium. Uh, machine learning, um, being able to Python, these sorts of things, again, hot right now. Um, anything to do with artificial intelligence, anything to do with genomics um, and and biochemistry going to grow theories you really need to look at the, the the technologies that are on the start of that upswing that are about to come down and go across the sort of trough of disillusionment so again anything around autonomous vehicles machine learning artificial intelligence biochemistry and, and um you know genomics anything like that i think are going to be um, very successful anything that involves picking things up and moving it you know um, planning forecasting those sorts of things not so much not so much. The, the machines, unfortunately, I think are just, you know, they can process more data, they can see more things, they can do things better than us. I wouldn't recommend a job as a taxi driver or a truck driver long term, um, although short term they might be quite profitable, but long term, not so much. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you. It are now uh, nearly 20 to 12. So unless anybody has any other questions, anything else on the chat, Kelly? Are you having a look at that? No, no. no. there we go. Okay, well, well thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much for that. It was very enlightening, very good. Um, and um, I'm sure everyone found it very useful. Kelly's details are on the screen there. Um, she will follow up uh, to get some feedback from you that will feed back to Sean as well. But uh, on behalf of us at K3, thank you for your time this morning. Um, and uh, I hope you found it useful. Uh, and please do get in touch with any other questions that you've got. And please do respond to Kelly when she reaches out to you with your, your feedback on this morning's session. So thank you, Sean, and thank you, Kelly. My thank pleasure. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.